Uh, to begin, we would like to acknowledge that tonight's event is taking place on the treaty territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation and the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabe, and the Huron-Wendat. Uh, we are grateful to have the opportunity to work in the community. I'm so grateful to be here with you all tonight. I'm so grateful that we get to experience works like the film that we're about to see tonight, made accessible by Kiva's thoughtful programming. So thank you, Kiva. Um, I want to start by say, talking about Egyptian cinema, obviously. One of my favorite things about Egyptian cinema is its stubborn endurance, especially under extreme duress. From colonialism to revolution, Egyptian cinema is constantly thriving and transforming against the country's ever-changing political landscape. The revolution in, of 2011 had an especially profound impact on Egyptian cinema in a way that signaled a new departure. There has been a movement away from star-studded, fast-paced commercial films, ushering in what Amir Taha refers to as new Egyptian cinema, a genre of independent films produced during and after the revolution, distinct in their slow aesthetic and minimal camera movements to create a more intimate storytelling experience. Filmmakers of new Egyptian cinema are less concerned with recreating the revolution and more interested in depicting the atmosphere and the stillness of life in spite of it focusing on the what now condition that follows. Coming forth by day is, of course, what we might call new Egyptian cinema, but in many ways it deserves a category of its own, and rightfully th so thanks to Hela Lutfi's spellbinding storytelling, with little else than a static camera and minimal dialogue. Having financed, written, and directed the full-length feature herself, it was produced over the course of three years, just before the uprising in 2011 and completed in 2012. Despite where it sits in this historical sequence of events, the entire film is characterized by a general resistance. There is a refusal to explain the revolution. Instead, Lotfi captures the monotonous rhythm of a working class family's small apartment, using long stretches of time to create a meditation on the banality of everyday life and the ordinariness of death. It's through, it's through this that she creates a narrative that is itself revolutionary one that's less preoccupied with the sensationalism of the uprising and more with the humanity of those left behind. The focus here isn't the Harir Square, but the struggles of mother and daughter, burdened by the expectations of day-to-day -day life in contemporary Cairo. Set over the course of 24 hours, Lutfi uses absence to sketch out an impression. With her languid camera, we witness we're witness to the boredom and despair of her characters in a way that eliminates any linear sense of time. There is no choice but to calibrate our viewing to Lutfi's speed. The film's protagonist, Suad, played by Dunya Meher, is a 30-something woman who lives at home with her parents. Her father is silent and bedbound, incapacitated by a stroke. Her mother, a sleep-deprived nurse who shares little else with her than the responsibility of her father's care. There's a sense of hopelessness and solitude as Saad and her mother awaken to another day of vigilant caretaking. In the confined space of their apartment, time feels like it's been stretched to an eternity against their efforts. There's a sense that they've never fully gotten the opportunity to be in their bodies or their lives. Every movement is in service to something other than themselves. Can they survive the solitude of what they can't change or embrace? This is the question that sets up the story. In the absence of dialogue, Lutfi's outspoken political spirit is interwoven in the film's narrative through gestures rather than statements. Drawn out scenes and images act as reminders that tragedy and political suffering are not reserved to any one particular time, but are overlooked as they occur in the stillness of everyday life. Where time is the mode of production, death is the language that Lutfi uses to tell the story. From beginning to end, this film is intimately concerned with issues of death and dying. As the majority of the story transpires inside of the apartment, you are in an active medita meditation on time and morality. Every now and then, the silence is disrupted with the tension between Saad and her mother as they speak about their father. His physical presence is rarely acknowledged, but his disability dominates their lives as if his self has already departed and what remains is a non-living figure. Saad's daily routines are documented with meticulous detail in stretched long takes, hand washing her father's soiled clothing, dressing and undressing him, turning over the mattress, massaging his atrophied limbs, attending to his bed sores, reminding her mother over and over again to ask about a home hospital bed. 
I'm reminded of Chantal Ackerman's Jean Delmont, a matter-of-fact presentation of a woman's everyday rituals documented in distinctly long takes like Lutfi's, each gesture and sound steadily accumulating dramatic tension, routines repeated day in and day out with the same underlying anxiety of a ticking time bomb, both films illustrating with rigorous, rigor, rigorously shot scenes how the burden of expectation restricts each protagonist to the sphere of a woman's domain. Relief eventually comes when Saad manages to leave the apartment for a few hours. As she pursues several aimless errands, there's a sense of unease in her mannerisms, as if she's not entirely sure how to exist. Each interaction in the streets of Cairo plunges her further into loneliness. Her conversations turn inwards as she struggles to connect with those around her each stranger a ghost-like figure in a city that feels like it's dying. The film borrows its title from the ancient, book of, ancient Egyptian Book of the Dead, or in its literal translation, The Book of Coming Forth by Day, a funerary text which consists of a number of spells used to assist the dying as they travel to the afterlife in the company of Osiris. So I and her mother are just on the very brink of coming forth in preparation for a death neither of them are willing to acknowledge either out of guilt or taboo. The unspoken burden of caring for a disabled family member is rarely a topic discussed in an Egyptian household, and of course, neither is death. Towards the end of the film, Suad visits Cairo's necropolis, the actual city of the dead. Made up of graves and mausoleums, the area is now overrun with drug dealers and petty crime. And it's here among the dead that Suad finds the peace to negotiate her place amongst the living, her unease making way for the possibility of relief and an acceptance of what's to come. Here marks the beginning of a breaking point that never arrives, a prelude to her coming forth to live. Lutfi's ability to weave a revolutionary narrative through such ordinary moments is not something that can be replicated. Her staging of time isn't interested in with outcome or causality. Her work commands you to look and pay attention. The focus isn't on what was or what will be, but what is happening in this very moment in time. For Lutfi, what's more radical to her is a deep awareness of time and space, because it's only when you're paying attention that we give ourselves permission to be human, in our bodies, in a place. Eventually, the film's slow accumulation of time never quite culminates, or so it feels. We're left wondering if death can reanimate Saad's life, if the resentment between her and her mother will ever dissolve, if they'll find some camaraderie in their shared burden, and if they can build a life of what is left. Simply put, we're wondering if they'll be able to move on. But as Max Porter's narrator describes in Grief is a Thing with Feathers, moving on as a concept is for stupid people, because any sensible person knows grief is a long-term project. The lack of payoff, then, is like grief without a full recovery. Lutfi knows this was an intimate detail. After all, revolutions take time. Thank you.